Good morning. With Eric's permission, I've taken my mask off so that maybe you can hear me a little better rather than speaking through a, a piece of cloth. But I'm glad to see that everybody is taking the masking uh, seriously uh, here at Ekoji. Uh, it, it's really great to be here. I Last time I was here was, I don't know how many years ago, but a uh, long time ago. <clears throat> and of course, as um, we have a close relationship, BDK, we have a close relationship with Ekoji. I have sort of kept up with what's uh, happening here, but it's always good to be here in person and to see uh, everybody uh, and um, talk about um, the future, talk about uh, how uh, we can make uh, Ekoji uh, through cooperative uh, relationship uh, grow. Uh, I come from Hawaii. Uh, I taught at the University of Hawaii for over 30 years. Um, I taught the history of, of Japanese religion. And so it was always a pleasure really to be able to talk about religion in Japan. And yet at the same time, live in a place like Hawaii, where we're just surrounded by so many uh, Buddhist uh, temples and, and Shinto shrines uh, as well. There are 90 Buddhist uh, temples left in Hawaii. At one time, there were about 150. Um, and it, it, the, the rise of Buddhist temples really uh, follows the uh, history of sugar with the sugar plantations coming up uh, all over in all of the different islands and with many Japanese immigrants coming over to work at the sugar plantations. They brought over with them their Buddhist faith and established uh, many Buddhist temples. They're mostly dying now. <laughs> there are 90 left. But they, 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 they remain pretty much as beautiful structures with um, elderly uh, f uh, members and, and very uh, few members. And as each year goes by, we see one more Buddhist temple closing, another one closing, others consolidating. Um, it's, a, it's a real uh, struggle. Uh, I'm a historian, so I look at things in terms of the, the the past and in terms of trends and in terms of what has happened uh, in the past. And it's clear to me why it is that the Buddhist temples in Hawaii are dying, and that is because they are not keeping up with change. And that's true not just for religions, but for any business or any any one of our personal lives as well. If we don't keep up with change, you know, we um, we're going to be left um, behind. Uh, I'm wearing an Apple Watch, I have you know, uh, two days old. My son, daughter-in-law, and grandsons forced me to wear this. Grandpa, if you fall down, it'll call 911. Really? <laughs> so, you know, I have to keep up with, uh, with, with change as well or uh, be uh, left uh, behind. But the Buddhist temples have not been uh, really keeping up with change. Um, part of it is demographic. Um, most of the Japanese Americans who used to form the core of the membership are gone. Um, <clears throat> very few people, uh, well, the sugar plantations are gone. And so there, there, there are no uh, communities left where, you know, you need uh, sugarcane uh, workers or plantation uh, workers. And so, so that has changed. But the other change that has taken place is within our families um, the, the, it, itself. So if I look at my family, for instance, I'm third generation. So my grandfather came from Japan. My parents were born in Hawaii. I was born in Hawaii. My grandparents spoke only Japanese. My parents spoke both English and Japanese. And I basically uh, speak only English, uh, even though I learned Japanese in college and did all of my research and publications about religion in uh, Japan. But in terms of you know everyday usage, um, it's it's pretty much gone. I look at my son, fourth generation, very American. I look at my grandsons. They don't even know what their ethnicity is. Uh, I asked my grandson, what are you? And he's actually a mixture of Chinese, Japanese, and um, French, German, and uh, half of Europe. And um, he, he didn't know what he was. So I said, look at your parents, you know. So his mother is uh, pure Chinese American. His father is Japanese, uh, uh, Caucasian. And um, they couldn't figure it out. I said, add the two together. You know, they still couldn't figure it out. I said, look at your mother. What's your mother? And she's, you know, pure Chinese. And they go, um, um, white? 
the 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 change that is going on is is to me amazing i look at my grandsons and you know see the generational change and of course there's always change uh, i mean gaps between generations but you know what's going on with that generation is just amazing um i i arrived in uh, san francisco they live in the bay area a couple of days ago and my 16 year old grandson came out to greet me and he had diamond studs in his ears and I thought, no way would that have passed in my generation. <laughs> but at any rate, you know, so change is happening. And the temples have not kept up with, uh, with, with change, demographic change, uh, intellectual change, cultural change. Um, <clears throat> and so they're, they're dying because temples uh, kind of by nature remain uh, conservative. They want to do things as they've always done in the past. Um, you know, you can see that here, you guys chanted a chant that I'm sure you have no idea what you were chanting, um, but you do it. Why? Uh, because that's what we've always done. <clears throat> um, so, you know, you got to watch out for those kinds of old habits where you just do it because you've always done it and with no real rationale for how does it fit in with my life? How does it fit in with my community? You know, does it really make sense? Does it help me in, in any way? And if it doesn't, then why am I doing it? Well, the answer is because you've always done it. And so, you know, there is this habit that, that kicks in and we do things uh, by uh, habit. And so the, 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 the temples are, are dying <clears throat> and um, there are only a few temples that uh, show, Japanese Buddhist temples that show real signs of, of uh, meeting the challenge of change meeting the challenge of modern times. And as I look at the whole scene uh, in Hawaii, a little bit in California, which I don't know as well, but still getting some, some glimpse of what's happening there. And certainly as a historian, looking back at the history of Buddhism uh, in Japan, uh, I look at Ekoji and I say, there's a bright light here. Ekoji is gonna show the way to the future. I make that prediction. Ekoji is going to show the way uh, to the future. Uh, look at your congregation, how diverse you are. Uh, look at the kind of things that uh, you're going to be doing in terms of using technology. Uh, look at the kind of uh, programs that uh, you are carrying out. Uh, you're being led by uh, people like Andrea who understand that education is really the, the key. Uh, in traditional Japanese Buddhist temples, it's it's not education. You're not there to learn anything. You're there to perform rituals. And that's what is the old habit that in in back in the day of my grandfather and my father, and even in my own day, sustained the temples because that's what we went to temples for, was for the rituals, for funerals, for, for uh, memorial uh, services. But that's not the case with the new generation and with you know, contemporary uh, society members. And uh, people want to understand, and this is why it's important to you know, understand what you're chanting, understand what the, what the teachings are. And the emphasis that Ekoji is placing upon education, I think is the way to the future and is the way to really sustain um, Buddhism. Buddhism has been a very creative movement. There's a fundamental creative spirit uh, behind uh, Buddhism, which is why in the history of Buddhism, you see so many changes. You know, there's, there's always something new coming up. Shinran, the founder of Jodo Shinshu, which this temple belongs to, was a radical. I mean, a real radical. Monks in his day and age were not supposed to get married. I mean, that was heresy. And what did Shinran do? He got married. And then he had children. I mean, this is like, wait a minute, you're supposed to be celibate. You're not supposed to be having relationships with women or having children or eating meat. That he, he broke all the rules and founded this tradition, which continues to this day, right here at Ekoji. And why does it continue? Because he broke the rules. Nothing is more traditional than breaking from 
tradition. And traditions that don't change die. And so traditions have to continually change in order to stay alive. And there's always that tension between continuity, you know, what should not change, what should be the core, what should be the, the, the heart of, of, of the teaching, and what should change in terms of manner of expression, about how we think of it, about our interpretation, about our understanding. What does all of this mean? What does it mean for my life? My life is different from my parents and my grandparents, and certainly different from the time of Shinran. So what worked for them in the past may not work for us in the future. But the, 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 the whole tradition, tradition of Buddhism is to keep innovating, is to keep being creative. And you can see this in the very nature of the scriptures themselves. The four scrolls there you see, you know, those are the scriptures. And the scriptures in every religious tradition are looked upon as being sacred, being holy. You know, it's, it's not just any old book. It's not just any kind of writing. And in Buddhism, the scriptures, also called sutras, all purport to be the preaching of Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha. Now, Happy New Year, 2023. Shakyamuni Buddha lived about roughly 500 years BC, which means Buddhism is about over uh, 2,500 years old. That's a long time. And the only way in which it has managed to survive is to be creative, is to be innovative, is to change. Because as I said, traditions that don't change die. And so we see that in the scriptures themselves. So the Buddha lived 500 years before Christ. And the first scriptures, the first written sutras appear around the time of Christ, around the first century BC, first century AD. In other words, 400 to 500 years have passed since Shakyamuni died, when people, and we actually don't know who they are, sat down and wrote what it is that Shakyamuni said. Now, how did they know what he said four or 500 years ago? Four or 500 years ago, Columbus set out and so-called discovered the new world. And it would be as if we were to write for the first time, the very first time now, the voyages of Columbus. Hey, remember what Columbus did? What did your dad tell you? What did grandpa tell you? And we write it down. How accurate do you think our account will be about Columbus's voyages? How accurate do you think the accounts are in the sutras, the sacred scriptures, when they write down what it is that the Buddha said? Now, people say, well, you know, the oral tradition, you know, <clears throat> passed down. We, we know two things about the oral traditions. They can be very accurate. They also can be notoriously inaccurate. You've all played ghost telephone, right? You know, you start a message up here, it goes down, and it comes out something completely different at the end because we hear differently, we understand differently. <clears throat> And so the message changes as it passed down. So it's hard to imagine that for four or 500 years, the message of the Buddha would have been so accurately and faithfully passed down so that what we have 500 years later is a reliable record of what the Buddha said. Now, here's the other problem with uh, what the Buddha said. The scriptures that appear 500 years after the Buddha died, continued to appear for centuries after centuries after centuries. New sutras appear for a long, long period of time. And the whole collection of sutras is huge. Now, these sutras constitute the so-called teaching of the Buddha. You know, it's the, the canon uh, one end, you know, not, not the weapon with two ends, the canon. 
And the amazing thing about the Buddhist canon is that it's open. The Christian canon is closed. You cannot add any more gospels to the New Testament. The Jewish canon is closed. You cannot add any more prophets or Psalms to the Hebrew Bible. The Muslim canon is closed. You cannot add any more surahs or chapters to the Quran. And they're all about this big. How big is the Buddhist canon? It's from about Wyatt to me here, maybe even farther. There are over 4,000 different texts in the Chinese canon. At BDK America, we're involved with the translation of the Buddhist canon. There are over 4,000 different texts there. We've been doing it for 40 years, and this year we published number 96. Um, it's going to take a long time before we finish this, uh, the, the, this project. But it points out this in, the incredible nature of how large the Buddhist canon is. The other character, <clears throat> characteristic about the Buddhist canon is that it's so contradictory. And throughout its history, people who have actually read more than just, say, four sutras, but have read like a dozen or maybe even a hundred uh, different sutras, are amazed at how contradictory it is. Uh, there's a scholar, a Japanese scholar in the 17th century who said, you know, if the Buddha actually preached all of these sutras, he was one confused man. It's so contradictory. And so what happens is that every denomination picks. So Jodo Shinshu would pick, you know, four. Well, there are hundreds of sutras. What about them? You can't handle it all. You can't incorporate it into any meaningful system because it's so contradictory. What does this mean? It means the Buddha never preached all these sutras. Hundreds of years later, people, and they're mostly anonymous, so we don't know their names, sat down and wrote out the sutras. And they have a literary style. They all start out, or most of them start out with saying, thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was on Vulture Peak and all the disciples had gathered around him, and one of the disciples, maybe Ananda, said, oh, world honored one, tell me what is the meaning of life or whatever his question was. And then the Buddha speaks. And then Ananda asks a question. And then the Buddha speaks. And so there's a kind of a question and answer uh, style. Not, not all of them are that way. Some of them are just straight out narratives. But the Buddha, again, teaches the tradition, says 84,000 different teachings. Why? Because everybody's different. And everybody will hear something different. And so you get to pick and choose from this huge collection of scriptures. What makes sense to you? This is what I mean by the creative spirit. You know, it's not authoritarian. It's not saying, this is it. Believe this or what? Go to hell or something. Um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, it, it, it's really wide open. It's like a supermarket. Of, of scriptures, and you get to choose. There's a, there's a remarkable trust in each individual's ability to figure out what the truth is. Uh, you know, in, 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 there's famous uh, dialogue with with the um, <clears throat> with the uh, with the Buddha, where a disciple comes up and says, "Oh, tell me what happens after we die." Buddha said, how do I know? I'm still alive. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there are several versions of what the Buddha said when he, uh, when he himself died in his so-called last words. And, and, and one version, again, there's, there's so much to choose from, you know, so one uh, version that I choose to, uh, to pick for the Buddha's last words is, uh, monks, figure it out yourself. 
So again, you know, there's a tremendous confidence and trust that we are able to, 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 to do things, to figure things out for ourselves, to decide what is true, what is meaningful for ourselves. And yes, we can go read, read the hundreds of different sutras and some will strike us as extremely boring. Some of us, will some will strike us as being utterly silly and some of them will strike us with the thunder of truth. This is it. And so you get to pick and choose. And so Buddhism is kind of a supermarket. You can go in and <clears throat> pick what it, is, what it is that makes sense to you. Now, and so there's no, there's no uh, authority up there. There's no Pope that says, you know, this is what you have to believe in. Whatever I say is infallible never wrong, and so on. <clears throat> so we're all in this together, and we're all trying to uh, figure it out together. And we have the, the, the pleasure and the advantage of reading through hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of sutras and being able to pick out you know, what makes sense to us. So the canon is open. It is so open that you and I can sit down and write the sutra. And you're going to say, oh, no, that's, that's, so, that's so disrespectful. That's so uh, heretical. But look, thousands of Buddhists in the past, again, anonymous, we have no idea who they are, wrote sutras and said, this is what the Buddha said. And we know as historians, that's not what the Buddha said. It's what that writer said, the Buddha said. That's the nature of the canon, like it or not. People wrote their own sutras. So I wrote a sutra. It's called the Diamond Head Sutra. And uh, my good friend in Japan, <clears throat> who's the former president of Taisho University, uh, one of the uh, Buddhist universities in Japan translated it, so it exists in it, it's published in Japanese. I never published it in in English, um, but you know I, I followed the uh, the the pattern. Once the Buddha was on Vulture Peak, and all the disciples gathered around him, and <clears throat> a disciple stood up and said, "O oh, world honored one, tell me whatever his question was, whatever it was that was on his mind, whatever it was that was that was bothering him or her." So at the University of Hawaii, we have a senior citizens program where any senior citizen can come and take a, any class for free. The only condition is that there's an empty seat, you know, that you're not displacing a student. And so I used to get, you know, senior citizens. Um, I, I had, they called themselves my groupie, my groupies. He <laughs> said, we're your groupies. Um, all elderly women, wonderful people bringing their maturity and their life experience, so different from the, the students that I had, you know, who are just starting out on their life uh, experiences. But at any rate, one of these, these women came to my office one day and, and it, was, it was just when I had given a lecture about what I had just told you about, what's the nature of Buddhist uh, uh, sutras? Um, when were they written? Who wrote them? Did the Buddha really preach them? And how it is that we have this creative license really to speak for ourselves and put it into the mouth of the Buddha. Imagine that. And she came to my office and she was totally distraught. In fact, she was bawling. She was crying. Uh, and what's wrong? She sat down and she said, my granddaughter was just killed in an auto accident. This is my only granddaughter, she said. And she's the one who knew about the senior citizens program. She's the one who said, grandma, grandma, let's go to the university and take courses. There's this program where you can take courses for free. <laughs> she used to commute. Her granddaughter would come and pick her up. They drive to the universities. They go off to their separate classes. At the end of the, the day, they get together and they talk about, what did you learn today? 
what was said in your class? Well, in my class, this, in my class, that. She said, it was the most wonderful experience I've ever had with my granddaughter. And now she's gone. What am I going to do? What am I going to say? What do I know what to tell a, a woman who's in this situation, ha situation, having just lost her granddaughter? And for some reason, I'm not exactly sure why, maybe because I have just been talking about this in class, the class in which she was, uh, she was in. And I said to her, why don't you write a sutra? And she said, what? She said, I said, you know the, 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 the format, you know, thus have I heard, you start out that, thus have I heard, once the Buddha said, Dana was on Vulture Peak and a disciple stood up and said, well, she left. <clears throat> a few weeks later, she came back and she handed me one page. It was called The Old Woman's Sutra. Once the Buddha was on Vulture Peak, and all the disciples had gathered around. And an old woman stood up and said, O world honored one, my granddaughter has just been killed in an auto accident. We were having such a great time going to the university together and now she is gone forever. What am I gonna do? And the Buddha said, tell me about your granddaughter. And the old woman said, and it went like this, the, the dialogue for back and forth. The Buddha said, the old woman said, who's writing this? The old woman. Comes down to the end. Oh, world honor one, tell me, what am I going to do? And the Buddha said, your granddaughter will never be able to finish college and therefore you have to finish college for her. And that's what she did. She enrolled as a regular student and she started taking courses and she graduated, not that she needed it. She's an old woman retired, but she did it for her granddaughter. And she, you know, came back later and said, it, it, it was the most amazing experience because every course I took, every lecture I sat in, every exam I took, you know, I did it for my granddaughter. I did it in my granddaughter's place. And now she has graduated from college. What happened there? How did the woman find the answer to her dilemma. She figured it out herself. But it's in the form of the Buddha. And this makes total sense when you think of the Buddha's teaching that every person has the Buddha nature within him or her. Everybody has the potential to be a Buddha. And so to those people who would say, you have no right to write a sutra because you're not a Buddha and you know your retort is, no, maybe not now, but I have the potential to become a Buddha. And now I'm going to tap the Buddha nature within me and I'm going to resolve a problem that has really been bothering me and is a really thorny, difficult one. And the Buddha is going to help me solve the problem. And who is the Buddha? It's herself. It's you. It's yourself. Tremendous confidence that we all have the capacity for working out <clears throat> the solutions to the, the, the real problems that we face in our lives. Every person has the Buddha nature within him or her. Every person has the potential to become a Buddha. So it makes total sense that you engage and it's really clever, you know, the, 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 the literary structure of the sutra <clears throat> where there's this, <clears throat> excuse me, pretense, literary pretense that it's the Buddha speaking. And it's actually just you. It's just you. And you are qualified 
to speak for the Buddha because you are the Buddha or have the potential to be the Buddha. This is why there are thousands of Buddha sutras. This is why there's, they, 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 they were you know, being written by you know, who knows whom, uh, dealing with so many uh, different uh, situations and in, with each of those situations, finding a solution to some kind of dilemma. So in closing, Ekoji, write your own sutra.